Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. It doesn't really feel like the world is making much progress right now. The COVID pandemic killed millions, left many more of us locked up and miserable for months on end. The Earth is apparently in the process of sizzling us all to death through climate change. Russia's invasion of Ukraine brought war to Europe and nudged the world closer to nuclear Armageddon. All of this while inflation is soaring, massive economies face recession and children will start living with their parents until they're my age. Well, if you believe what you read, then this broken and battered world of ours has ever been more racist, sexist or divided. Who better to put all this into proper context, though, than my next guest, Professor Stephen Pinker, who coined the term progressophobia. Professor, great to see you. Thank you. I've wanted to have you on this program for a long time because I actually quoted from you from your brilliant book, Enlightenment Now, uh, in my own book uh, called Wake Up Last Year. And it was like a clarion call to the world to wake up. And one of the reasons was, as you rightly observed, actually, all things considered, there's never been a better time to be alive. Now, do you still believe that today? Well, I don't know about... Uh, this very moment and this very day, but certainly it, uh, we're better off now than we were 100 years ago or 200 years ago. There are always ups and downs, so it's uh, it's always dangerous to say this today, this very day is the best day in history. Probably isn't. We've got an invasion in uh, Ukraine that's turning back the clock. We're still not over the effects of uh, COVID, but you know, on average, looking at the overall trend, yeah, we're better off than we were 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years years ago or a thousand years ago. A lot of young people uh, suffer from anxiety far more than has ever been recorded before. And I, I believe one of the reasons is the constant dopamine exposure they get to negative imagery, whether it's the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, whatever it may be, that this sensory overload has created an atmosphere in their, in their heads that things have never been worse than they are now. What's the best way to realign young, impressionable minds about why, in your estimation, the trend's pretty good? Yeah, it's, you know, it's not just the, the dopamine hit of the image every 20 seconds. It's also the overall message. Uh, a lot of young people are being told that the species is going to go extinct, if not from um, uh, climate change, then from artificial intelligence or, uh, or, or uh, civil war. Uh, so I think the news just has to put things in perspective because the journalism is a non-random sample of the worst things happening everywhere on, on Earth. That's just kind of what news is. Uh, the slow trends that creep up a few percentage points a year, like the reduction of extreme poverty, increased access to electricity and clean water, uh, rising literacy, declining child mortality, declining maternal mortality, uh, all of these are never never burst on the scene on Thursday, and so you never see a headline, right. but they transform the world because right. these changes uh, compound. Also, there are things that good things that consist of things that don't happen. Like just a few years ago, we were obsessed with terrorism. It's, it felt like right. there was constantly a terrorist attack. Now uh, they are uh, uh, far less frequent, but you never see a headline. It's been several years since a European city has been uh, shot up or, or, uh, or blown up by terrorists. So the news gives a non-random sample of the uh, generally of what's going wrong. And so more of a focus on long-term trends, on putting particular events in statistical context, so that a school shooting or a police shooting doesn't mean that you are in danger if you uh, step out onto the pavement, uh, just so that people can put the anecdotes and images in context of which way the world is going. Also, when it comes to, to, more, to things that are creeping up on us, like climate change, um, some perspective as to uh, what is, uh, again, what is, what is going right? What are the changing estimates of the probabilities of the different scenarios? A lot of young people can't get out of our head their heads the worst case scenario, yeah. which seemed uh, disconcertingly too likely a few years ago. But now the estimates are that the worst case scenario is is much less likely. That's the kind of news that needs to be uh, highlighted. And the people who are counseling young people, I, I have I have seen this even at my own institution, uh, dealing with say climate anxiety. And they say, well, yes, it's such a serious problem that it's very good that you're anxious. Mm. Well, no, your anxiety is not going to save the planet. 
your actions are going to save the planet if you develop clean meat or clean energy or better policies. But simply being miserable is not going to help the planet. And yeah. unfortunately, a lot of our councillors are conveying exactly the wrong message. Well, funny enough, there was a report only last week about uh, actually the, the incidence of depression and anxiety amongst young people. And it, it established really quite clearly that if you could distract those people uh, by making them think about positive things or other stuff than the stuff, the negative things they were dwelling on, actually it had a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. They ended up feeling more positive and less depressed. I don't doubt it. And it, it, the, the reaction you get to that kind of suggestion is, well, the world is burning and uh, things are getting worse. You don't want to instill complacency. You don't want people to think, oh, everything is great. I can lie back and relax. Well, of course, that isn't the message. The message is things get better only if you make them better. But you've got to have the confidence that trying to make the world a better place might now and again, now and again work. Mm -hmm. And the message that we've been sending is nothing is working. Despite everyone's efforts to make the world a better place, things are getting worse and worse yeah. until the species goes extinct. And so the, the message can't just be, uh, let's distract ourselves with, you know, with, with, with kittens and, and heartwarming stories of you know, a policeman who buys groceries for a welfare mom. But that, that's not what constructive journalism would consist of. It would consist of uh, the growth of renewables, the new technologies on the horizon that might deliver abundant clean energy, the, uh, the countries that have eliminated diseases, the new vaccines for diseases like malaria and, and, uh, um, uh, and other diseases, the uh, rising literacy rates, the decline of coal, uh, there's lots of actually substantive positive developments that are simply not reported, except for a handful of sites that specialize in it that I think more people should subscribe to yep. for their mental health and for no other reason. But also to involve the, the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, countering the danger of complacency is the danger of fatalism. doesn't yeah. matter what we do. The I world's totally... going to hell, may as well enjoy things or may as well just be useful. Yeah, I totally agree. Um... One of the other scourges of modern life, other than this constant obsession with all things negative, is the attack on free speech. You went to Harvard University, and it was just ranked the worst school for free speech in the United States by the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. It got zero points out of 100. How do you feel as a Harvard alumni that it has effectively become a walking, talking enemy of free speech? Yes, well, I'm not... Uh... I'm not an uh, undergraduate alumnus, but I am a professor, so I'm, right. I'm right there in the thick of things. And together with some colleagues, we, we have formed the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard in order to push back. And in fact, those rankings were even a little bit convenient because when we met with the president last week and when we're meeting with the dean tomorrow, the first thing we're going to uh, do, uh, and the first thing we did was to say, hey, we came in in last place in 248 universities. Don't you think we should do something about this? Uh, and I hope we will. Why, why are university campuses all over America, and it's happening in the UK, why are they not embracing free speech? Why are they so insistent on trying to suppress people's views, deplatform people whose views they don't like? How have we got to this place? Well, I, you know, I would I'd almost flip the question. Free speech is a deeply weird concept as far as the human mind is concerned. It's very unintuitive. What's obvious is, that people who disagree with me are spreading dangerous falsehoods and must be suppressed for the greater good. That's just the natural way we think. The idea of free speech, going back to a little bit the ancient Greeks and John Stuart Mill and the free speech movement, that constantly has to be renewed. People need to be reminded of why they should ignore their instincts to suppress voices they disagree with, step back and realize hey, it feels like I'm right, but you know, I'm not infallible, I'm not omniscient. A lot of people in the past thought they were right, they turned out to be wrong. A better system is one where everyone gets to voice their opinions and we get to uh, argue about who's right and who's wrong. Well, I do think, uh, Professor Pink, that as long as people like you are still at Harvard, there's a hope, there's a tiny fragment of hope for them when it comes to defending free speech. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you on the program. Well, 130 colleagues have joined the council. <laughs> I wish you, you luck in getting them all on site. Uh, it's great to have you on Piers Morgan. So thank you so much indeed for joining me. Thanks.